Network News. Where we give you a new perspective on events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, episode 44. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. This podcast is proudly listed at podcastpickle.com. In this episode of GNN, uh, we will be continuing with our reading of chapters from the new book, There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. And I hope that you're enjoying listening to these chapters. And again, this is our gift to you, our faithful listeners, as a free audio book to you of this really fantastic, really exciting, new, and innovative book that has come out by Brian Hogan. And again, in the show notes, you can find a hot link to where you can get your own hard copy of that if you wish. One of our sponsors is GoDaddy.com. And GoDaddy.com has just recently told us that we could give you a special deal. If you click on the GoDaddy.com icon on our website and go to GoDaddy.com, anything that you purchase there, you can get a 10% discount if you put our promo code in there. Our promo code is CJC and then the word SAVE and the number 10. Again, that's C-J-C-S-A-V-E and the number 10. And then you'll get 10% discount off of anything that you order through GoDaddy.com. Visit GoDaddy.com today and get all of your internet needs taken care of. There's a sheep in my bathtub. Chapter 10, Left Bank Theater of the Absurd Even as we prepared to join Magnus and Maria in Erdnet, I was on the lookout for places where the gospel had never been preached, targets for the future teams of Mongolian church planners we'd be training and sending out. When we finally felt more settled and confident, and with the advent of long summer days, my feet were itchy to explore outside of Ulaanbaatar. It wasn't hard to convince Lance to join me in a trip to Zunhara. We both had time off during the Nadam holidays, a midsummer Mongolian Olympics. Zunhara was perfect. It lay along the railway line in the Hara River, smack dab in the middle of the most gorgeous countryside on the planet. This was a town we had passed through often on our way to Erdnet. The train would stop in Zunhara at 10 p.m., just as the last light of the Mongolian summer sunset was failing. These last images out of the train window each trip imbued Zunhara with a certain mystique. Rather than remain perpetual faces pressed to the window, Lance and I actually wanted to get off the train there. Standing on the platform at Zunhara as Galt Teregin Budel, watching our train pull away to the north, we realized it was too late for second thoughts. Night was falling, and we had no idea where we were going to stay. We didn't even know if Zunhara had a hotel. Our only contact was not a name or an address, but a ham radio handle. There was really nothing to do but hoist our packs and set out in the direction the other passengers had taken. We passed under a large monument to Sputnik, the first satellite, and laughed about the fact that we'd nothing to fear in such a modern metropolis. It didn't seem reasonable to go around asking where the ham radio guy was. We didn't even know his name. So as we walked, we asked for directions to the hotel. Most shrugged and told us they didn't know of any. A few questioned others passing by and started little discussion groups on the subject. 
enough gestured in one general direction that eventually we ended up in front of a small, single-storied, plastered building with a wooden sign on the door announcing it to be a Zochidbotl, Mongolian for hotel, that translated literally to guest stop. The young woman who answered our knocks turned out to be the proprietor, and she quickly made it clear that we were the first foreigners ever to honor her establishment. We were shown to the hotel's only room, which was furnished with two beds, four chairs, and a small table, all antiques. I'd barely put my pack down when a group of rough-looking guys pushed into the room and stared at us as if we were extraterrestrials. After all the greetings, during which we learned that the leader of the pack was the hotel's handyman, they all sat down on the available beds and chairs. They proceeded to question us about every detail of our lives and what we wanted to do and to see in their town. I guess this worked up a powerful thirst in them because they, without waiting for invitation, opened and drank every bottle of pop we had brought to help us avoid uncertain water. When they finally left around midnight, we were left with all the empties. The hotel lady came back in to introduce her seven-year-old son. This long-haired kid displayed none of the customary shyness around foreigners, perhaps we were because we were his first. Then she told us to sleep well and tied us in for the night. Literally. To our surprise, we noticed that the door had a gaping hole where the lock should have been. There was a rope in a corresponding hole on the door frame, and for security this was tied shut each night from the outside. Too tired to argue or think of an alternative, we let it go. We undressed and fell into our beds and slept until 3.30 a.m. I was awakened by the sound of our door being untied. Because nocturnal robberies were not unknown in Mongolian hotels, I was instantly awake with adrenaline pumping. I noticed Lance was ready, too. Even in the dark, we were surprised to see the slight figure of the hotel lady, rather than a burly brigand, come through the door. She turned on the light and motioned to us to go back to sleep. I was flabbergasted. We watched speechless as she pulled a chair into the middle of the room, directly under our room's sole naked light bulb. Then she grabbed a stool from the hallway and placed it on the seat of the chair. Climbing cautiously up on top of this shaky tower, she began carefully wiping the glowing bulb with a rag, all the while studying us in our beds as surreptitiously as she could. It was an astounding balancing act, worthy of any circus. After an intensive cleaning, she clambered down and put the furniture back. She motioned again for us to go back to sleep, turned off the light, and tied us into our room again. I was at a complete loss for words, but Lance grinned and quipped, Motel 6, we'll dust the light off for you. Our laughter must have woken anyone else asleep in the building, and probably the neighbors too. The next morning we were untied and had sausage and bread from our packs for breakfast. We would have been forced to swallow it dry had not the hotel lady brought in cups of steaming tea. She never mentioned her cleaning of four hours earlier. We figured it was just a case of overwhelming curiosity. What do Americans look like while sleeping anyway? I did ask her where I could get a haircut, mainly because I thought I could avoid the long wait that always seemed to accompany trips to the barbers back in the capital. She said she was a barber and I could have one later that day. It was the first day of Nottam, and the whole town seemed to be walking or riding toward the outdoor stadium across the river. We joined the crowd, and after a two-kilometer walk, we found ourselves at the center of the festivities. Many families had camped out at the site, and their many tents brightened the grounds. The largest was the judge's tent, right next to the competition field. Today's event was wrestling, the most popular of Mongolia's three national sports. Horse racing and archery were each scheduled on other days during the festival. Our white skin placed us at the center of attention wherever we wandered. It wasn't long before the officials had half invited, half compelled us into seats of honor at the long judge's table, under the shade of the judge's tent. This was great because the day had quickly heated up. As we watched the wrestling eliminations and the eagle dance every victor performed, I struck up a conversation with the doctor they'd seated next to us because he was the only guy in town, with the exception of the ham radio contact we'd never found, who spoke any English at all. He was clearly nervous, as if the honor of the whole region depended on his mostly forgotten English from medical school days. The contestants ranged from the rookie 
a lanky, wiry boy just completing his military service, to the towering veteran heavyweight with legs the size of tree trunks and an enormous belly hanging over his bikini briefs. All wore only leather briefs and a colorful long-sleeved vest that barely covered their upper back and was completely open in the chest, apart from a cord pulled from the sides to hold it on. On their feet, all wore a guttel, cumbersome and ornately embroidered knee-high leather boots with upswept toes like the tips of skis. I had heard that this outfit originally had been designed to keep the manly sport of wrestling, well, manly. Apparently, at some point in the far distant past, a woman had entered the contest in drag and had beaten all comers. The shame of this, once revealed, had been enough to cause officials to change the uniform to one that left very little to the imagination. There were pairs of wrestlers standing all over the grassy field, and all matches started simultaneously. Some faced each other in a crouched stance, poised for either offense or defense, others leaning heavily against each other with legs braced widely to each side, holding each other firmly by their scanty wrestling costumes. As Lance and I watched the tournament, we noticed that each of the individual matches followed a set form. The two wrestlers each had a PR guy or manager in full traditional Mongolian regalia, long dell, onion dome hat, and the same boots the wrestlers wore. This guy would hold the wrestler's hat and dell, shout their praises before each match, and generally be in their corner. Some competitors were eliminated before they started, when their opponent turned them on their head almost as if it were a formality. If any contest lagged for too long, the manager would encourage his man by giving a slap to his rear. Real championship matches could continue for more than an hour. Imagine watching a pair of sweating giants locked together motionlessly, each awaiting the opportune split second in which one would slam the other to the ground with lightning force. All that had to happen was for either opponent to hit the ground with more than just his feet. Then it was over and the winner would majestically and ceremonially mimic an eagle in flight, slowly flapping his arms as he lifts his knees high, while soaring around a stand of poles adorned with something resembling a wig, the historic standard of the Mongolian horde. Some of the victors would come to the judges' table for a bowl of eidig, fermented mare's milk. Our great seat in the judges' tent, with their close-up view of the action, would have had any sports fan in ecstasy but I was conversing with the doctor and eating from the plates of food lining the tables. Other than the fatty slices of mutton, in which the flies were just a bit too interested, the best item on the deli plates was the biaslik, Mongolian cheese. It was very mild, with a rubbery, soft texture on the inside and a tough, rubbery rind. In experiments at home, we discovered that it refuses to melt. It instead just sweats and eventually bursts into flame. Tragically, this stuff has no properties conducive to pizza. Anyway, the meager breakfast and the walk out to the field had induced an appetite, and I was on my sixth or seventh piece of Biaslik when our doctor friend motioned for me to stop. This was the first time a Mongolian had ever tried to get me to stop eating anything. Usually they were forcing things down my throat in the name of hospitality. He tried to explain, but all I could understand was that it wasn't safe. I questioned him further, and he used a Mongolian word I'd never heard. He could see I wasn't getting it, and he tried very hard to come up with an English word from his rusty vocabulary. He brightened and declared, Fika! Fika? What is that? He pointed to the cheese and repeated, Fika! I still looked puzzled, so he said, English word, Fika! I've never heard it. Is the Biaslak Fika? He nodded and smiled. I decided to get Lance involved. He, too, had no idea what this guy was talking about in Mongolian or English. The doctor just kept saying, Fika. Finally, we both looked so puzzled, he got up and began to act it out. Lance and I made quiet jokes about charades. The doctor pointed to the plate of cheese and then squatted and mimed an outhouse activity. I began to feel queasy. Fecal? Is that what you're saying? Fecal? Yes, yes, that's it. Fecal, he said, overjoyed at my understanding. The biaslag is fecal, I demanded with a sinking feeling. He agreed happily. I had lost all my appetite and was wondering how hard it would be to self-induce vomiting. I turned to Lance. This is so gross. 
Why, what's fecal mean? demanded Lance. It's medical jargon for human or animal waste. Yuck! The expression on Lance's face matched the wretch in my gut. I never did get ill from that cheese, although we didn't find out what the doctor had really been trying to warn me until our return to Ulaanbaatar. That's one of the problems in learning a new language. If no one nearby speaks your tongue, checking your observations can get sticky. There was nothing wrong with the Bieslik. The doctor was just letting me know that it tends to affect one like prunes do, and can be inconvenient if one eats too much, too far away from the Bizasakskatser, or the body repair place. I was belatedly quite relieved, so to speak. That evening, the hotel lady, true to her word, gave me a haircut. Word had leaked, and a small crowd had gathered to watch. She did a fairly good job, considering the pressure of having an audience for her first attempt at curly hair. Afterwards, a good part of the male populace followed me into our room for conversation in broken Mongolian. We soon discovered that everyone in town was a professional photographer. At least that's what each told us as soon as he caught sight of Lance's camera. It was strangely ironic so many photographers lived in the same town and none of them owned a camera. The most outgoing of these guys actually got us to agree to let him guide us into the countryside the next day. As I ushered our last guest to the door, the hotel lady's son ran by, completely bald. Apparently I'd created a monster with clippers. The next morning we went exploring with the photographer. We walked several miles to a place on the river away from all human habitation. As I crossed a creek, the branch I was using as a bridge snapped and my jeans were soaked to the thighs. It was such a perfect summer day that the obvious solution, out there in the middle of nowhere, was to hang up the pants in a tree and let them dry while I fished with the drop line I'd found on a shop on our way out of town. We spent several hours at this bend in the Hara River nestled under a huge rock hill. Our guide insisted on taking a picture of Lance and me with the hill as the backdrop. So Lance gave him the camera and we posed. He began to snap pictures as rapidly as he could. We began shouting and gesturing that he should quit. He'd snapped off twelve shots before we wrestled the camera away from him. Again, he assured us that this is what he did for a living. On the long hike back to Zunhara, our guide insisted on stopping at every gear we passed to show us off. Mongolian hospitality requires hosts to serve a meal to all guests, so by the time we left the fifth gear, we'd been overfed with mutton, dumpling soup, noodles, biaslig, yogurt, candy, bread, and endless dairy products until we were in serious pain. Anyone who has ever encountered a determined Mongolian host or hostess will tell you that saying, no, I'm full, will get you nowhere. They force it on you anyway. We finally flat out refused to be introduced to any more of our guide's vast circle of friends along our route. When at last we reached town, he insisted we go into this restaurant where his friend worked with him. He made it clear that they wouldn't try to feed us since it was closed for Nottam and it wasn't a home. Inside the restaurant, actually it was a Gawans, the local equivalent of a greasy spoon, We found his friend, a burly woman wielding a large butcher knife, busy carving up an enormous hog back in the kitchen. A cigarette with a long, drooping ash hung from the corner of her mouth as she mumbled. We sat near her at a table and talked while she worked. I was amazed at how much pure white fat fit on this pig. She was cutting off whole slabs, which she then cubed. After about ten minutes, we started making our goodbyes and getting up from the table. The woman gestured with her knife, making it clear we were not free to go yet. To our complete dismay, she served us each a plate of rice with barely steamed cubes of pig fat all over it. I told our guide to explain that we couldn't possibly eat this now, but thanks all the same. He just shrugged. I tried to explain this to the lady, but she said something back I didn't catch, although her meaning was clear by her expression and the way she pointed her knife. We'd clean our plates or else. When I want an image of hell, I think of this meal. I know hell is much worse. I just can't imagine how. Somehow, I was finally able to choke down every last piece of fat while our determined hostess stood over me to make sure that I received her hospitality. When we escaped outside at last, our guide was still in the restaurant making his goodbyes. I asked Lance if that wasn't the worst experience of his entire life. 
He said, that wasn't bad at all. I looked at him incredulously as he emptied his pockets of wads of money. He had dropped each piece of fat onto a one, three, or five two-grick note in his lap, and then surreptitiously twisted them into little bundles and pocketed them. He had eaten none of the fat, unobserved by the woman, as she glowered at me. A five two-grick bill was only worth one cent, so it hadn't cost him much. Lance then gave his portion of the unfortunate pig a decent burial by treading it into a nearby mud hole before our guide stepped out. As soon as we escaped into our hotel room, we collapsed into our beds. We had both been overfed into a stupor and walked to exhaustion. I was drifting off to sleep in the gentle breeze coming through the open window next to my bed when someone screamed. I screamed in response and shot straight up into the air. This startled Lance, so he did the same thing. When I recovered, I found the hotel's handyman rolling around in the garden under my window, holding his sides and laughing uncontrollably. After we had each gotten our hearts to stop trying to jump from our chests, Lance explained what had happened. Lance had seen the handyman tiptoeing along outside our room toward my window. Guessing the guy intended either to spy on our naps or scare me, Lance had pretended to sleep while keeping an eye on the action. When the guy had leapt up and screamed right next to me, my violent reaction had frightened Lance as well. We had ended up providing a show I am sure was the talk of Zunhara for weeks to come. The handyman came into our room to recount it and act it out several times, laughing hysterically the entire time. I felt like a surprise guest on Zunhara's hit game show, Westerners Do the Darndest Things. After he'd gone, Lance asked me, When our guide was snapping all those pictures of us today, had you already put your pants back on, or were you still in your underwear? Neither of us could recall. We laughed until we were sore. I made him promise not to show the pictures to anyone until I saw what had developed. As it turned out, I had been dressed for the photo shoot. We still have a fistful of photos in which Lance and I, trying to get his camera back, advance toward the camera, ever closer to the photographer in each shot. I had mixed emotions as we caught the train out of Zunhara at 10 o'clock that night. As we rumbled north to Mongolia's second largest city, Darhan, I already missed the quirky small town where odd rural Mongolians had so quickly become friends. This was just one of hundreds with absolutely no Christian witness. I resolved to send as many Mongolian church planters as I could out into these unreached villages. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party I was ever at in all my life. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll Today in Zunhara there is a growing church planted by Mongolian apostles from our Darhan daughter congregation. Chapter 11 Vacation of Ill Repute Once summer finally came that first year, we were more than ready to get out of Ulaanbaatar. Even a glance at a map of Mongolia shaded with its yellow and brown tones draws the eye to a blue jewel in the center of the country's remote north. This large, deep, pristine lake is one of the country's most distinctive features. Hovsgol, mirroring its much larger sister, Lake Baikal, across the Russian border, drew us like a magnet. We decided a vacation to Lake Hovsgol was the perfect thing to refresh our weary city-dweller souls. Apparently, I'd already earned a month-long vacation. The architecture firm I worked for shut down every August so employees could hadoyauch. This phrase meant go to the countryside, but functioned in society as a universal excuse for shortages, absences, inefficiencies, for almost everything. As I talked the trip through with my co-workers, it became clear travel on our own in Mongolia would be very difficult. Fortunately, one of the architects had a sister living in Murun, the town where our plane would land, and another relative living in Hatgal, a town 40 miles north of Murun at the southern end of the lake. He wrote me a letter of introduction to his sister and sent it with us, insisting we ask for her immediately upon arrival in Murun. We planned to fly from Ulaanbaatar to Murun, to stay in Murun a couple of days visiting other missionaries, and hire a jeep to take us north to Lake Hovsgol. In Hatgal, we planned to stay with my co-workers' relatives while we enjoyed what that beautiful locale had to offer. Our main problem would be food, since the farther you got from the capital, the scarcer were the food supplies. 
We decided to bring what we could ourselves and trust in the usual hospitality of the Mongolian people we'd meet along the way. When the big day finally arrived and it was time to board a plane for the central regions of Mongolia, we discovered domestic air travel in Mongolia is a completely different matter from travel to other countries. Our plane was old, intended mostly for cargo, and dangerously overcrowded. There was no assigned seating. A ticket merely gave you the right to struggle for a place to sit. We didn't each get a seat of our own, but with God's help, Louise and I got all three girls onto the plane. Murin is a sort of county seat for the large surrounding area. Even so, it had only one hotel. So we hailed a car. In Mongolia, any car is a potential cab, and one need only waggle a hand at it to get a ride. We went straight to the hotel, hoping to get a room. It turned out to be no problem. The only other guests were several long-haul truck drivers. We showed the innkeeper our letter of introduction, and she sent a messenger to tell this woman to come to the hotel. Nada arrived within the hour, very excited to meet someone sent by her relative in Ulaanbaatar. She was very gracious and took us off to her house to feed us and introduce us to the other relatives. Then, while she was at work, we were able to explore the town of Murin on our own, taking in the museum and former zoo. Apparently, the animals had all been eaten during the food shortages of the previous year. The zoo was now a sad, weed-filled place. Our hostess arranged for a car to take us to the lake. Somewhere near the appointed time, this Russian jeep, a ubiquitous model called a 69, pulled up to our hotel and we piled in. Then we began a long journey over some of the worst roads we had ever traveled. Our driver raced over the rocks and potholes in such a reckless manner that we feared for life and limb. Our daughter Melody gets car sick, and I lost count of how many times we had to yell, Zox! Stop! and to let her out to heave into the bushes. When we finally arrived in the tiny town of Hotgal, we were sore, dusty, tired, rattled, and thankful that the trip was over. As we were leaving Murin, our hostess had given us a second letter of introduction to their relatives at the lake. After asking just one person, our driver was able to take us directly to their house. This couple, Hotbot Nenki, and their young son and niece lived in a log cabin with a big yard surrounded by a fence, right on the shores of Lake Hovsgol. The locale was stunning. Mountain, forest, and lake surrounded us. My eyes, like famished prisoners, drank in the deep green and sparkling azure beauty after six months of the gray ugliness of Ulaanbaatar. The pain of thousands of needles pricking as my legs returned to life just made everything outside that horrible vehicular torture rack seem all the sweeter. The family, who had no idea who we were, received us with the same enthusiasm with which they'd received their own long-lost relatives. They actually slaughtered a sheep for us, and we feasted on freshly boiled mutton that evening. They had never heard a word of English, and though communication was painstaking and frustrating, our stay with them was the best time of language learning we'd ever had. We ate together and struggled to ask and answer each other's questions. As the long summer day came to a close, we were wondering where we were going to sleep. The one-room cabin the family lived in was clearly not big enough to accommodate all of us. The solution came as the mother led us to the next house over, for which she was caretaker during the owner's absence. She opened up this larger two-roomed cabin and made sure we were all settled in for the night before leaving. This time, no one tied us in. Everything went fine until about two o'clock in the morning. We woke up to a loud truck pulling up outside. Then the front door opened, and in came the rather large family whose house we were sleeping in. We felt rather like Goldilocks when the bears came home. These people did not even blink when they saw strangers sleeping in their beds. Apologetic, we began to get up and out, but they wouldn't hear of it and insisted we stay put. Somehow they communicated that they would just cook some food and then go somewhere else to spend the night. We were aghast. There was no way we were going to put them out of their home. American manners came up against Mongolian hospitality and were completely routed. We stayed in bed while they cooked a meal. Grandma hacked away with her rasping tubercular cough, and everybody laughed and talked. At 4 a.m., they piled back into their truck and roared off. Needless to say, we never got back to sleep. We felt so bad about taking their house from them, even though they didn't see it that way. The next morning, we told our hosts we'd feel better staying in the local hotel. I had noticed a large wooden hotel in Hotgal the day before, and had made a mental note a room there would be far more comfortable than the floor of the one-room cabin. 
However, when we brought up the idea of transferring to the hotel, our hosts were horrified. We tried to assure them that we would still eat all our meals with them and partake of their wonderful hospitality, and we only wanted to free up the house for the family that actually lived there. From the reaction we got, it seemed that they had understood us to say that we were going to drown ourselves in the lake, not simply check in at a hotel. Finally, through sheer perseverance, we were able to gather up our things and walk the four blocks to Hot Doll's only hotel. It was an expansive wooden edifice that had originally provided lodging for communist bigwigs visiting the Young Pioneers Camp and barracks next door. Since the fall of communism, the camp had closed and now seemed like a ghost town. The hotel, however, was clinging to life, and the current owners were trying to make a go of this strange new market economy. We were surprised to find, upon checking in, these owners were three young women. Among them, they had several infants and small children, but all three appeared to be single working mothers. They were quite happy to see a large American family show up and ask for a room. As we walked the entire length of the hotel, I noticed most of the rooms we passed were bare. At the end of the hallway, there was a sitting room with four suites opening off of it. All of these were furnished, I was relieved to see. The young woman who walked us back opened one of the rooms and gave us the key. The girls were tired, so we quickly got them tucked into the beds and down for a nap. Louise and I set about unpacking our things and putting them into the tastefully antique wooden dressers. We had just finished when an insistent tapping began at our door. Mongolians don't knock and then wait for an answer. They tap constantly and steadily until the door is answered or until they get bored. I found the girl who had checked us in at the door. She told us we had to move to the room next door. I tried to explain it was too late. The girls were sleeping, we were comfortable and already moved in, and we liked the room. She insisted we moved, growing a bit frantic at my resistance. I pointed out that we were the only guests in the entire hotel, so leaving us in this room could hardly be a problem. She pushed past me and began to gather our things and move them herself. I decided this had to be another of those inexplicable things that happen with great regularity in the foreigner's experience. It is easier to go along than to resist. Determined Mongolians have a lot in common with Star Trek's Borg. Resistance is futile. We gave in and began carrying sleeping children to beds in the next room. All we could figure out was that the hospitality imperative must have compelled our inexperienced hostesses to upgrade us to a better room. The view was much better from our new room. It was on the corner and had two walls with windows overlooking Hotgal and the mountains. When the girls woke from their nap, we explored the town a bit, found a wonderful antique traditional copper kettle in a shop for next to nothing, and wound up at our host family's place on the lake for dinner. They seemed surprised that we were happy about the hotel and had no horrors to report. We didn't bring up the room snafu. Just a little after dark, Hotbot walked us back to our hotel. Tired, we went to bed. Around eleven that evening, we were awakened by loud laughter coming from the room next to us, the one we had so briefly occupied. As we listened to the growing din, we realized that a large party was going on right on the other side of our wall. It actually sounded like the girls were being tickled in there. Neither Louise nor I could sleep, and we were worried that our girls would wake at any moment. So I got up and dressed to go and ask them to quiet down. I knocked on the door several times before anyone inside heard me. When the door finally swung open, I wished it hadn't. The scene inside was not easy to erase from my mind. A bacchanalia was in progress. Filled with shame and embarrassment for those within, I averted my eyes down the hall, and in my halting Mongolian told the man at the door, My children, sleeping, don't make loud, please stop, laughing. He laughed at this request and told the others. As they all laughed louder, I heard a couple girls trying to shush them. I assumed the hotel girls were trying to do both their jobs at once. I went back into the room and told Louise, now I know why they didn't want us to stay here. Our hostesses seem to have embraced capitalism. They really are working girls. This is the town bordello. As we tried to figure out why they had to use the room next door to us out of the entire hotel, we came up with a theory that we never had the nerve to check out. That was a bit deeper into culture study than we wanted to go. We decided that the house of ill repute was having a sale. The advertisements must have said, come to this certain room at 10 o'clock on this certain night. That explained their panic when they had put us in the best room and then realized what night it was. 
we were grateful they had moved us after all. Our hostesses did manage to finally quiet things down, and the party seemed to dwindle away within another hour or so. The next morning, all three of the hotel girls showed up at our door with mutton stew, hot water for our in-room sink, without plumbing, towels, and a very contrite, anxious-to-please-and-make-amends way about them. They even said sorry several times without mentioning what they were apologizing for. They were certainly hard to stay angry at. As a pastor of ours used to tell us, you can't demand righteousness of a people who have no access to it. Until the gospel could penetrate such remote locations as Hotgal, the people would have no idea about the one who gives his righteousness. The rest of the vacation went much smoother. We took a small motorboat trip up the lake and spent a couple of nights in an old fire brigade camp hoping to become a tourist resort. We didn't see much hope for them unless they imported something beyond sticky noodles to feed their guests. The quaint custom of putting the bill into negotiation before allowing visitors to leave was also discouraging. Still, Hovskull's eye-popping grandeur of steep mountains dropping sharply into azure waters was unforgettable. When we were about to board the plane going back to Ulaanbaatar from Murun, our hostess presented us with gifts. She insisted we take a large plastic bowl brimming over with berry jam and a whole fried chicken in a mesh bag. How practical! These would have been difficult items to travel with on any airline, but this particular Miat flight was even worse than our flight out. When the plane pulled to a stop, the crowd wanting to go to the capital rushed the runway and struggled to get past the deplaning passengers. Imagine an entire rugby scrum climbing up a ladder. We shoved the bowl of jam into a plastic bag and entered the fray with luggage, girls, and gifts in tow. Mongols took pity on us and lifted the girls out of our hands and onto the plane. Louise and I were not at all sure we would be joining them on this flight. In the end, God smiled on us. The entire family made it safely back home. Even the jam didn't spill very much. Ever since, whenever I refer to this trip as our vacation, or break, Louise stares daggers at me. Just over two years later, an identical plane, perhaps the same one, crashed near Murin, leaving 40 dead and a lone survivor. One probable reason for the accident was the added weight of unregistered passengers, known as rabbits, bribing their way on board. The wreckage and remains were strewn across a densely wooded slope. The destruction and mingling of human remains meant a final death count was never known. Chapter 12 language acquisition made pitiful. The famed linguist Betty Sue Brewster had trained us to learn language in context, in community, the way children do. Betty Sue and her late husband Tom had called this style of language learning language acquisition made practical, or LAMP for short. Our perspectives class had introduced LAMP, and later Betty Sue and her son Jed had taught for a week of our School of Frontier Missions. We had bought in to the LAMP method for our assault on the Mongolian language. I agreed with Betty Sue that we would best learn both language and culture, not through study and research, but rather through being with people. The small amount of material available on Mongolian language and culture made formal study in the States an exercise in futility anyway, and we'd already learned from the Navajo that the difference between the books and the reality was enough to make or break a missionary. It was with this understanding that we excitedly hit the streets of Ulaanbaatar with little more than Betty Sue's injunction of learn a little and use it a lot, ringing in our ears. Our daily goal was to speak a few memorized lines to 50 individuals. This often resulted in more than just the usual hilarity. The Dreaded Hat Mongers the Zach was Ulaanbaatar's swarming sanctuary of burgeoning capitalism, free markets at their most freewheeling. The actual English equivalent of Zach is bazaar, or outdoor market, but everybody I knew called it the black market. It wasn't actually illegal like a proper black market, but after 70 years of communism, any expression of private enterprise and profit was viewed with a mixture of anxiety and longing. Mongolians were at a crossroads and deeply conflicted about quickly changing standards of public morality. Business was still a bad word, and a businessman was commonly described as being unemployed. 
Yet, the most popular pastime was hatching schemes for enterprises that would open the floodgates of wealth. The only people getting rich in the new economy were the businessmen, while most people were still stuck on the idea that private property and profits were theft. This left most Mongolians scheming how best to embark on what they still saw as a life of crime. Into this gap between the real and the ideal grew the Zakh, a large, flat area nestled in the hills on the north side of Ulaanbaatar, filled to overflowing with people buying and selling. It first appears as complete and utter swirling chaos, an undulating sea of black hair. Thousands and thousands of Mongolians, along with their wares, jam into this limited space, creating one of the most densely populated spots on earth, in the middle of the world's least densely populated country. There are vague sections where goods of a certain type are to be found, a shoe section, hardware, rugs, precious metals and antiques, pets, even a food court. Sellers would stand with their items held out for viewing or spread out on a blanket at their feet. The variety of wares was ever-changing and endlessly fascinating, at least to me. I loved to visit the Zakh, even though it meant a taxi ride to get out there and back. If I bought furniture or anything too big to carry, I would have to hire a horse cart to transport it back to our apartment. Once, Lance and I were sitting on a couch I had just purchased, perched upon a cart behind the horse and driver. We were joking about doing the royal parade wave to crowds that we were passing through. Suddenly the cart hit a massive pothole and we flew into the air. Both of us came back down hard onto my new Mongolian-made couch and, with a loud crack, the frame snapped in two. When we reached home, the driver helped us get the poor couch up five flights of stairs and into the apartment. Lance and I turned it over and figured out what was required to fix and strengthen the broken frame. Another trip to the Zakh, of course, to get the required hardware. The Zakh was a language learner's dream. Our strategy for learning Mongolian was LAMP, which holds as its main premise that language learning is not an academic exercise, but a social one. The best way to learn is to get out and talk with native speakers. I would memorize a short script in Mongolian, then go out onto the streets and markets and practice it on 50 people. Hello, my name is Brian. I am learning Mongolian. I don't speak much yet. Will you help me? Goodbye. Sanbano, mini nerig Brian gedig. Be Mongol health search ban. Be box zirik yerdik. Ta tos I'd note people's responses so I could discuss them with my language helper, Mujo. Then I would learn and add a new phrase like, I am an American, be American, to my spiel. The next day I'd go out and do it all again. There was no better place in all of Asia for meeting 50 people quickly than the Ulaanbaatar Zakh. One crisp spring day of about negative 10 centigrade, I was slowly moving through the masses at the Zakh, not really shopping for anything, just learning. I inadvertently wandered into the section occupied by the dreaded hat sellers. This particular group of merchants was best avoided completely, and I generally gave their area a wide berth. Their product was fur hats, immense fluffy fur hats no local would be caught dead wearing. These hats looked like a blow-dried, long-haired cat had crawled onto your head and died there, and only tourists were ever seen underneath one. Perhaps because of the near-universal distaste for their product, the hat sellers were renowned for pursuing their quarry and refusing to accept a simple, no, I'm not interested. In their piranha-like zeal, it was common to find them surrounding you, shouting as they moved along with you as a pack, thrusting huge fur balls into your face for inspection. Even the locals tried to steer clear. However, I hadn't been paying sufficient attention to where I was at in the vast marketplace. Two ladies on the fringe of the pack, armed with a box of hats, caught me. Quickly, I launched into my memorized Mongolian phrases as I frantically pretended to examine their hats, hoping against hope they wouldn't start yelling their sales pitch. Malka aware! Take this hat and draw the pack's attention onto me. Their box of furry hats really looked just like a box of dead cats. This gave me an idea for some fun. While I talked, I worked my hand down to the bottom of the hats and got inside one of them. 
Just as I came to the end of my little speech, and before they could launch into obnoxious selling, I quickly pulled up the hat and made a sound like a frightened cat. The result startled even me. Both women shrieked and fell backwards into the crowd, throwing the box of hats up into the air. I jumped, too. One lady ended up sitting on the ground. The hats were everywhere. In seconds, the shock turned into laughter, the ladies laughing loudest of all, as people nearby and I helped gather up the scattered hats back into the box. We had to reenact the joke several times to the continued glee of all concerned. This was my first experience with the physical nature of Mongolian humor. To the Mongolian mind, one can never have too much slapstick comedy. The Three Stooges could have taken over the country without a shot. Making Friends on the Bunny Slopes One day, during our second winter, I was returning home from a successful trip to the Zach, laden down with treasures, the largest of which was a large electric walk in a box. It was a bit of a struggle even to see out from behind the stack of packages as I carefully picked my way across the vacant lot next to our apartment complex. This field was all steep hillocks of dirt and broken concrete, punctuated with protrusions of iron rebar. Some care was needed when crossing it at any time, but covered in fresh snow, as it was that Saturday afternoon, required the circumspection of a cat. I reached the summit of the mound nearest our building and noticed an old woman cleaning her winter dell at the bottom of the slope in front of me. I assumed that's what she was doing. I had never seen anyone rub snow into the sheet fleece that lined the Ouste dell, or fur-lined dress, before, but I had noticed dozens of folks doing an identical thing to their carpets after each fresh snow. Fields would fill with children vigorously rubbing snow into the large carpets that lay on every Mongolian living room floor, then shaking and beating it out with sticks. Apparently the dirt went with the snow. Shortly after a fresh, pristine snow, every vacant lot would be covered with these squares of soiled snow, resembling a dirty gray quilt. At any rate, this grandmother looked up the hill from her task at the huge foreigner, loaded with packages, towering up above her. She appeared a little startled and dropped the dell she was finishing into the snow at her feet. To take the edge off her shock, I called out a Mongolian greeting. San Banu! Are you well? Unfortunately, at the very moment of meeting between two alien cultures, my size 13 boots turned into downhill skis. I began to slide down the hillock straight for the terror-stricken woman. Showing a remarkable agility for one so advanced in years, she shrieked and leapt sideways at least a meter. This cleared the way for me to fall flat and face first onto her freshly cleaned dell as my boxes went flying in every direction. Immediately her winter dell started moving, and the added momentum of a fairly hefty American turned it into a sheepskin sled. Fortunately, the ride came to a halt after a few meters. Silence descended. I was trying to figure out how to get up, collect my things, and escape without showing my face any further when I heard the laughter start. I looked over for the source of this mirth and saw the old woman sitting on the snow where she had landed, holding her sides and laughing her head off. Even though I was mortified, it was one of those embarrassing moments so extreme that laughter is the only possible response, short of committing Harry Carey. I began to laugh, too. When she was able to gasp out a word, she yelled, Sanbano! in a fairly good imitation of my accented Mongolian. This convulsed both of us. It was hard to breathe, lying there in the snow, dissolved in hilarity with that woman. We lay there for several minutes, helplessly laughing our fool heads off, every once in a while barking out, San Bano! Finally, I was able to stagger to my feet, and I helped her to hers. Together, still laughing, we gathered my things, including the badly dented walk, which caused even more mirth. I said, Bayertai, and headed off to my stairwell entrance, her laughs following me the whole way. I toyed with the idea of pretending to live somewhere else, but realized that she and everyone else already knew exactly who I, the foreigner, was and where I lived. 
They tell you when you haven't mastered a language, it is almost impossible to tell a truly funny joke in that language. On the other hand, I found that Jerry Lewis-type humor translates very well. It may be hard to tell a joke, but one may become a joke without any effort at all. For weeks thereafter, every time I would walk by the groups of old women sitting outside our building, I would overhear the words, Amerikun, Sas, Sas is snow, and San Baino, followed by giggles and stifled laughter. There's really nothing like language learning to build humility into the man of God. Killing them at the funeral. Soon after moving into our first apartment in Ulaanbaatar, we met the retired couple next door. We wondered how we would be received as the first non-Mongolians ever to live in their building. This couple's friendliness, in spite of the language barrier, was heartening. One of our local friends told us that the man next door was Mongolian KGB. This worried me a bit. Had we been permitted into this exact apartment so we could be watched? Louise and I resolved not to worry about it or to be covert in our actions. God had done such incredible miracles to get our family into the country. He could certainly keep us here. We would not be expelled unless God determined that we were finished with what he'd sent us to do. So we continued to develop a pleasant, nonverbal relationship with our neighbors. Because not many Mongolians had phones in their apartment, those who were blessed to have a phone line allowed the neighbors to come in and place calls. We had a line and we had a fairly regular stream of visitors using it. Sometimes people would even receive calls on our phone. I would have to figure out the apartment number being shouted into the other end and then go into the hall and up or down a flight of stairs to find the person wanted. Since we didn't know much language yet, we were always telling callers that we were Americans in an attempt to determine if they had the right number. Then there were international calls. Usually the phone would ring in one long, drawn-out wail to let us know it was a call from overseas. We would run to get it and find silence. The connections must have been very tricky because it often took three tries or more to connect. Then you had to yell out words, be careful not to talk over each other because all sound would cut out if you did. When we got a very early morning call from a Sunday school class in Salem, Oregon, so the children, who were all gathered around a speakerphone, could interview a missionary, we began to have second thoughts about phone ownership. My mind was complete mush. I must have sounded the complete idiot as I stumbled through their questions. One child asked me what my children were doing right now. When I said they were sleeping because it was the middle of the night in Mongolia, their very embarrassed teacher quickly terminated that call. Late one night, there was an insistent, steady knocking on our door. When I answered it, I found our next-door neighbor lady appearing very distressed. For several minutes, she tried to get me to understand something, but my vocabulary just couldn't handle it. Finally, she pushed past me to get to the phone. While she was on the phone, I looked up the terms she had been repeating about her husband. Nas Barsen. I knew the first word was the word for years, and the second I had learned as meaning run out or finish. Suddenly, I understood when the dictionary revealed that the pair meant death. She was calling 911, or the local equivalent. Her husband had just died. After she finished her call, I tried to comfort her. Usually it's hard to know what to say at these times, but I didn't even know how to say anything. It was so frustrating, especially as I was feeling really bad for keeping her from the phone for so long when she first knocked. Apparently, the impression of love and caring somehow made it through all my linguistic bumbling. Our neighbor lady invited Louise and me to the funeral reception. A gare was in, erected for a cookhouse in the courtyard five stories below our apartments. Since relatives and neighbors would be crowding in from all over, the apartment kitchen was not up to the task of cooking enough food. People would spend the whole day sitting and talking and eating in our neighbor's apartment. I went over to spend an hour or so in the afternoon. The small apartment was filled with people. Conversation was muted and somber, but the food and drink was being consumed at a healthy rate. I sat for a while, feeling kind of unconnected, until a young boy came and sat next to me. I decided to try out Mongolian language skills on him. How are you? My name is Brian. What is your name? The boy sat and stared at me and remained utterly silent. How old are you? Boy, not a peep. I paused a bit at this point, trying to think of something else he might respond to, even by gesture. 
other conversations trailed off as most were very curious about this American trying to converse in Mongolian. There were a few glares at the boy for being so unresponsive and rude. Then it occurred to me that if he could point his dad out to me, I could ask him my questions about his son. I would get to change the pronouns, a good substitution drill for language learning. What is his name, etc.? So I turned to the boy again and asked, Which one is your father? There were several shocked gasps around the room, and the boy's eyes went really wide. After a long moment of stunned silence, someone let out a loud laugh, and then the entire assembly erupted into gales of laughter. Everyone, except for the boy and me, was practically rolling on the floor with glee. I ended up joining the fun, although I had no idea what they found so funny. Whatever had occurred, I was now in. And when I left, everyone shook my hand, and several kissed me on the cheek. The next day, I recounted the incident to Mujo, my language tutor. I ran through the whole thing in English. He asked me to repeat exactly what I had said to the boy in Mongolian. When I came to the line that brought down the house, Mujo went pale. I asked him what the problem could be with a simple question of who the kid's dad was. Mujo explained that I had used the wrong word for which. I protested that he had just taught me this word a week before. Unfortunately, it turned out he had neglected to mention it was never used for people, only things. What I had actually said was, What kind of father do you have? Which is just about the worst insult in Mongolian. It is a direct challenge to the person's legitimacy. When I told Mungho how the shock had given way to laughter, he said everyone had realized I was a foreigner and could not have meant to be so vulgar. He also figured most of them thought the boy was being inexcusably bad-mannered and had it coming. My face was hot and scarlet with delayed embarrassment. Once again, I'm the life of the party. Another one rides the bus. Public transportation in Ulaanbaatar has got to be one of Mongolia's unique attractions. It should be televised as an extreme sport. During our first year in Mongolia, we would often get around the city by riding the bus network. There were several reasons for this. Tickets were incredibly cheap, the equivalent of about two and a half cents. We also worried that riding around in cabs might separate us from the people, making us look rich or elitist. The overcrowded buses were perfect for practicing our language scripts and for keeping warm, even in winter. It's hard to describe just how crowded these buses were. The closest Western equivalent would be Volkswagen or phone booth stuffing. The sensation is one of pushing your way into a solid, writhing mass of heavily clothed and padded humanity, standing there feeling crushed, pushed and pulled this way and that by irresistible tidal forces of the crowd, wondering how you will know when the bus has reached your stop, since all the windows are thickly frosted with condensed and frozen human breath, realizing that even if you do guess correctly where to get off, actually extricating yourself from the pungent mass will take superhuman force. Amazingly, one incredible being seems to be able to make her way through this mob like a hot knife through butter. The ticket seller. This lady manages somehow to force her way through the bus to each passenger and collect his or her fare, make change, and tear them off a tiny paper ticket. If some deadbeat resisted coughing up his pittance, this conductor would get fierce. I watched one ticket lady forcibly propel a man twice her size off the bus because he sullenly refused to pay. These scenes were rare because most were properly intimidated by the obvious powers of someone who could actually move like that through the bus. It took a while, but eventually we learned the hard way what every Mongolian instinctively knew. When carrying cash, take a taxi. Theft was rampant on the bus. On several occasions, caught in the crush of bodies, I actually felt the pickpocket's hands in my back pockets. Since my arms were immobilized, I was powerless to respond. I was glad I kept my money elsewhere. Many of the thieves were even more determined to get at hidden cash. They would use a razor blade to cut into pockets or bags, and the victim would know nothing until they moved off the bus and felt a breeze or found their belongings tumbling out through the new hole. I had my jacket pockets slashed open on several occasions. Louise sewed them back together each time, and we called it Frankenstein's coat. 
After losing significant wads of bills for the third time, we finally decided when we were loaded, we would hire a cab. When I told Mucho of our decision, he laughed. Mongolians never ride buses when they have that much cash. He also taught me the word for thief. Mucho explained that if you yelled Holgeich on a bus, the driver was compelled by law to lock down the doors and drive everyone to the nearest police station for a thorough search. I thought I might just try this the next time I was robbed on the bus. At our next tutoring session, I practiced on Mucho. He roared with laughter. He let me know that I was unlikely to achieve the desired result by shouting Refrigerator, Hurgach, on a crowded bus. The differences in Mongolian vowel sounds are subtle, and I obviously needed more practice before hitting the streets as a crime-fighting superhero.